Hello interwebs and welcome to my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 3 Episode 4, Forget Me Not. And let me just be honest, this is an episode that I will not soon forget. <laughs> As per usual, I'm going to give my spoiler-free thoughts before I get into my spoiler thoughts. So if you haven't seen the episode yet, don't worry. We'll be sort of staying spoiler-free for the first few minutes of this review. And just being entirely honest with everybody here, uh, this episode hit me very, 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 very hard. While this is my review and going to be my sort of encompassing thoughts on this, I literally just finished watching the episode right before doing this. And I am already certain that this episode is going to be one that I am going to need to rewatch and really think about and process because it honestly hit me very, very hard. I will not lie uh, and tell you I cried really hard several times throughout this episode because of just some of the ways that this episode hit me personally. Part of that is also probably just the state of the world right now, and I've just been so anxious the past few days for reasons that I'm sure many of you can understand. But even beyond that, this episode just spoke to me. Um, it does not mean I don't have concerns, and I'll talk about my concerns a little bit more in the spoiler-filled section. I do have some concerns, especially surrounding the transgender representation in this episode, which I thought was really, really beautiful. But there are also some things that it does that I think are complex and lean on some tropes that I don't like, but I think it uses those tropes in really intriguing and beautiful ways. And I'm not sure how to think about that. Again, I'll talk about it more in the spoiler section. And so I have probably more concerns and thoughts about this episode than any episode of Discovery this season for sure, and probably many past seasons. But they're all ones that I have many complex feelings about. I, I'm not here to say, like, I hated that or I loved that. I just, I just felt that. And this episode, that kind of brings me to my main point with this episode. This episode is a beautiful meditation on trauma and how trauma is not something we can fix immediately. It lingers. It can push us forward, but it also is something that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it just shows me that the writers of Star Trek Discovery are probably the most emotionally mature writers of any Star Trek show, at least this season's writers are, um, than any other Star Trek before it. I made a sort of realization throughout this episode that this episode and this season so far of Discovery is doing something that Voyager um, really failed at. Voyager was a show where the crew of the Voyager was in a place where they would have been dealing with immense trauma and immense emotion just given the situation that they were in, but the show just sort of bypassed that to go to a more episodic uh, story of the week type feel and really just denied some of the promise of that show. And Discovery is kind of taking the opposite route and just this episode brings us to a very like small scale level of how a situation like the Discovery crew is in, like being thrust in the future, really hits on a small scale character level and the trauma and pain and fear of that. And all of the actors in doing that just brought their A-game to this episode. I will particularly point to Blue Del Barrio, uh, Doug Jones, and um, uh, Wilson Cruz as standouts, but truly just every actor, Mary Wiseman, the actress who played Detmer as well. Um, so many actors just brought their A-game to this episode and it was just, it just hurt in some of the most wonderful ways. And like I said, I have some concerns. There are a few plot things here and there that I thought were a bit convenient, but the emotional core of this episode just rang true in a way I think that Star Trek has never done before. Um, not to say that Star Trek has been totally cold and emotionless before, but the emotional maturity and depth of emotion that were brought out in this episode were just wonderful. And I greatly appreciated this, this episode for it. <sighs> all right. Uh, I think that that is all I can say. Spoiler free. I, like I said, I have so many thoughts on this episode, so I just need to jump into them. And I, I already know that this episode is going to be one that I'm going to be processing even beyond this review, and I'm going to be doing many, many more videos on it even beyond this. But let's start diving into the specifics. So if you have not seen the episode, we're going to be diving into spoilers, so this is where you can get off if you don't want to be spoiled about anything else. All right, as I said, uh, 
this review is going to be, you know, my thoughts on the episode, but I know that I'm not going to be able to fully process this episode for a while, just given where I'm at. So just know that I am going to have more thoughts about this episode, even beyond this review, but let's get into it right up here. We start off the episode with um, Culber's log. I adored this sort of look at the daily life of Discovery um, now that they're in the future of all of them trying to find some forms of identity in the midst of just being thrust in the future. And that's a lot of how trauma works. This is sort of the beginning of this meditation on trauma that this episode brings us. Trauma is all about a losing senses of identity because of greater situations beyond your control. A situation happens and it makes you lose pillars of your identity and so you feel lost and adrift. And that's what this entire crew is feeling. And I love that Culper gets to be the one that narrates this because he is the one who was dealing with that last season. And I really love that both uh, Culber and then uh, later they call up Burnham in another episode, uh, scene in this episode that I thought was brilliant. Really, uh, this show is using these characters' past to inform their being able to handle trauma better than other characters on uh, the Discovery crew uh, in this episode. And I thought using Wilson Cruz for that was just brilliant. Um, and I just really love that this show is um, not disregarding its past. Obviously, this season has been a soft reboot for Discovery. But I am loving that this show is not saying like, ah, oh, those two past seasons, we, you're not going to really talk about them. This is a whole new start for Discovery. It's like, no, the characters' past have weight and it lends credence to the trauma and the ability to handle trauma that these characters are able to do right now. So I'm just loving that the show is a soft reboot, but it's not disregarding that past, and in fact, using it beautifully. So I loved the moodiness of this opening scene. I loved sort of the reminder of things like Detmer dealing with PTSD and the sort of daily life as the crew sort of wrestles with trying to find their identity in a world where they have no pillars of identity to hold on to. Great opening sequence to set the mood. Then we get a scene that's sort of like a plotty plot, uh, sort of like get us to know all the information we need to know uh, of the episode with with Adira, uh, you know, getting her medical exam in the in the sick bay. Adira does not have any memories of their Trill host, so they need to go to Trill in order to get there. Just sort of uh, get some explanation out of the way. This obviously makes sense because you know, Adira is a human and does would not have instant access to the Trill memories because of that. But I also like how this episode later up brings that up and shows us actually a, an emotional reason why uh, her memories are not being accessed. Then we arrive at the Trill planet and we get sort of the holograms on the bridge of the Discovery. I like that they're not using the view screens anymore because uh, that was sort of seen as quaint last episode. And I liked that the Trill uh, Voss, the sort of head Trill on the bridge, sort of acknowledged like, yes, the Federation is totally welcome here. So I like that Trill um, welcomes the Federation more than Earth did. And I like that sort of like uh, sort of uh, showing difference of acceptance of the Federation on different planets here. So I like that sort of parallel between those two. Then we get a really great scene between Stemets and Saru, where Saru basically comes down and says, hey, look, you were incapacitated, you were hurt, we need you to find a way to be able to run the spore drive without actually uh, having it be you anymore, not having to rely on you, because if you get hurt, killed, or incapacitated, you're not going to be able to run the ship. And I love that that kind of digs into Stemets because he's like, I was inadequate, I wasn't good enough. I know it wasn't outright stated, but wonderfully performed by um, Anthony Rapp that you can kind of see that it hurts him to acknowledge that. And then he lashes out at Tilly right afterwards because of that, because he feels inadequate. And I like that that's not explicitly stated, but you sort of see that wonderfully just played by Anthony Rapp, Mary Wiseman, and Saru. Also, I should say Saru captain like a boss in this scene. He was able to be stern, but understanding of Stemets' situation, but then also complimented Stemets and Tilly and saying like, look, I know you can do this. I trust you, but this needs to be done. Just captaining like a boss in that scene. So great, great Saru scene. Then we get what I thought was going to be my favorite scene of the episode between Culber and Burnham, two characters who we really haven't seen uh, do anything together, I think, much in the past of the show. But I like that they were able to come together and connect over the fact that they've gone through traumas, like Culber's traumas last season and the fact that... Um, uh, Burnham was untethered and had lost her pillars of identity here uh, when she came to the future. Again, just that wonderful connection and understanding of how trauma works um, here in Discovery. Just again, very great emotional maturity um, by the writers here and understanding these characters. And I love that these two characters connected that way through their traumas and shared traumas. 
Also, like I pointed out, Wilson Cruz is just such a warm soul in this episode and just so understanding. I like him kind of playing counselor to uh, everyone throughout this episode and kind of having that warmness to him, which he he lost a little bit last season, understandably so because of the aforementioned trauma. But I just like seeing Wilson Cruz just have that warm uh, feeling to him and and, will, and he just plays it so wonderfully. Um, brilliant scene between Burnham and Colbert here. And I like that um, Colbert says like, look, you can connect to Adira um, right now. And I think it would also help you. But he, again, he doesn't say it. He sort of subtly implies that it would help you as well. Then we just get a fun little scene between Adira and Burnham. And again, I like seeing the connection between these two characters. I like Burnham has shown that she's warmed up. Oh, I also like in the previous scene that um, Culper acknowledges that Burnham's used to be Spartan quarters are now more decorated. I love that little subtle call out that she's changed here. Um, but again, back to Adira and Burnham. Great little scene between the two of them. I thought it was a lot of fun. They had a good interplay like um, Burnham saying, you know, I puked and Adira's like, that's not helpful. I love the scene where uh, Burnham like walks away and has that smile on her face and Adira catches up. Again, and just wonderfully the opening up of Burnham as a character um, and showing that she's kind of moved beyond her sort of Vulcan-like sternness, getting to the emotional core of this episode, emotional maturity and growth that I've talked about before already. And uh, Adira just sort of having fun um, as well with her. Just great, great scene. Then we just sort of get a fun little scene between Culber and Saru, and I like sort of Culber again playing counselor and sort of pointing out to Saru that you need to take care of these people's emotional needs. Um, they're physically fine, but they're emotionally just off the charts. It's too bad that the 23rd century Starfleet ships did not have counselors on their ships like 24th centuries would uh, would have. You would you would think they would definitely need it, but Culber is at least fitting that bill here. Uh, but you, they need a counselor, Troy, most definitely. Then we get to the Trill home planet, and we get this really intriguing scene uh, where we kind of learn a little bit about the politics of Trill at this point, that a lot of the uh, potential Trill hosts have all died on Trill because of the burn, and so a lot of the history of Trill has been lost. And I like that sort of connection to like a big sort of emotional trauma, a generational trauma, a, a civilization trauma, um, having to do with handling past memories and feeling untethered from identities and their past self. And this is a brilliant, brilliant mirroring of things that happen in human history where we see many cultures that have gone through some sort of trauma like a genocide or a forced mass migration, which is a form of genocide, and have lost a lot of their history as a culture, have an intense cultural trauma because of it and an intense need to hold on to whatever history that they can. It's why you see many in the Jewish community uh, holding on to their culture and traditions as much as they can uh, to hold on to their identity. Identity. So we're sort of getting this emotional idea on the sort of um, a macro level as well as the micro level and Trill sort of dealing with their generational and cultural trauma of losing their past history and feeling untethered to their identity as well brilliantly done here but I also like that they connect that as well to connecting it to prejudice uh, the Trill have a prejudice against humans connecting with the Trill. Again, that sort of loss of identity. It's like, oh, a human has our, our symbiote. Again, something that we see in actual human history where when a culture has gone through such a trauma, it is hard for them to let a lot of other people in because they don't want to quote unquote dilute their culture. It's an understandable reaction, but it is also prejudicial. But it's also completely understandable because you don't want to lose your cultural identity by having others come in and possibly uh, changing it or making you lose a piece of what your culture was. It's a wonderful, no completely black or white, right or wrong answer to it. And I love that Discovery kind of hits upon it here. But it also connects to great ideas of um, like queer culture as well, or any marginalized group of like, oh, you're an abomination. You're not good enough. Um, just a sort of way that uh, societies can work. Some people are for letting uh, Adira keep the host. Some are against, and some are just like, oh, well, just get off the planet. I don't want to deal with you. These are all sort of ways that people um, deal with prejudice and things changing, even amongst their own trauma. And so, again, this is really complex, and I wish this episode had actually delved into this more, because this is really the only scene that kind of deeply dives into Trill society at this point. So this is actually one of my disappointments with the episode that we don't get a lot more with the sort of cultural politics of Trill. But there's definitely a lot going on here between dealing with issues of identity, dealing with issues of prejudice, um, when dealing with uh, when dealing with trauma about how we push people out. Um, I also like that the characters are literally, literally color-coded <laughs> by their prejudice. There's the red guy, the yellow guy, and the white guy, or the white girl, I should say, um, all just sort of like having their own distinct opinions. It was just kind of funnily color-coded that way. Um, but again, this is a scene that I think I'm going to need a lot of time to sort of like delve into the sort of 
thought process behind all of these characters and sort of extrapolate stuff out. But it is something that I kind of wish this episode had dealt with a little bit more. But an intriguing scene that touched upon cultural trauma, generational trauma, as well as um, prejudice that sort of when it gets sort of mixed in all of there and how people are like can't even see past their prejudice even when they need to reclaim their history. Uh, great, great usage of the trill here that I just really liked. But Burnham and Adira get uh, sent off the planet, but uh, obviously they are being set up to be attacked by the yellow-shirted Trill who really just wants the symbiote and will kill Adira to do it. Um, and then we Burnham uh, sort of attacks and, and says, like, and Adira says, this is not up to Federation code. This is not what the Federation does. Again, subtly implying that Burnham has changed a little bit and sort of is willing to bend the rules when she used to not want to bend the rules. So I like, again, that sort of subtle reinforcement that Burnham is a bit more running gun than she used to be. And then we get the red color coded trail guy who comes and takes them down to the cave a bit convenient and a bit like sort of like yeah now come down to the cave with me but i also like that it is used to reinforce that burnham has changed as well then we get the ai therapist where saru is asking the computer to sort of give ideas on how he can help the crew i like that one of the things that was called out was a coloring book i thought that was kind of uh that made me laugh a little bit but then the computer glitches and we get hints that the computer is able to move beyond its programming, which to me, and there's a subtle hint of this at the end of the episode as well, that we're starting to see the hint of the sphere data start to make discovery become sentient. Um, and this might be tying to the short trek Calypso, where we saw that uh, discovery had become sentient and had gained an AI um, that makes it, uh, you know, sentient. So I like that we're starting to sort of see seeds like we saw in episode two with the mention of the Vadre, seeds of what will eventually lead to potentially what happens in Calypso and what we see there. And again, there's another hint of that at the end of the episode that I will um, mention when we get there. Uh, the only thing I will say about this scene that is that Saru should be a little bit more worried than he actually is that the computer's kind of glitching out. But I like that it's again called back at the end of the episode. But uh, I, I am a little bit concerned that he didn't show as much concern as I would have thought that he should. Then we get uh, the wonderful, wonderful dinner scene between Saru and the rest of the crew where Saru calls all the crew to his his ready room, which by the way, I like the new Saru ready room look. I like that it transitioned from Pike's ready room to Saru's. Um, and I thought it just looks very Saru-y and I, I thought that that was very appreciated. But this dinner scene I thought was a plus amazing just absolutely fantastic this was a great scene for all of the characters they acted it all really well i like saru sort of reaching out and saying hey look i want us to all connect i gave the crew the time off but i wanted us to connect um and i thought that his his line where he says like i was there when you cast your ballot and it felt like a prayer i uh, cast your vote and it felt like a prayer i know that this episode was not timed to be released right around election day because this was you know intended to release well before now uh, because of the pandemic. It got pushed back to be released now, but what a very apt time for that line to come up. Uh, I just, it made me think of the election here in the United States and sort of our talk around voting as well. So I know that wasn't intentional, but it just kind of hit me with that moment. Um, but I, I thought there was a beautiful of, uh, moment of all of them saying, I, the actress playing Detmer, just sort of wonderfully playing her PTSD and showing that she's still kind of out of it uh, here, but just a beautiful scene. Um, and then the second half of this scene, I just thought was so human and so great. I just enjoyed all their interactions like with the with the haiku uh, and everyone just sort of joking around and having fun with haikus. All the actors just getting to play. Feel, it felt like a real scene. Um, like these characters just enjoying each other and just having a fun kind of family crew dinner that you I would have with my coworkers. Um, just very, very well acted. The only thing that I kind of called out that I was sort of like throwing me a little bit was the last time we had a dinner scene like this was with Empress Giorgio in season one uh, when she had dinner with uh, with uh, Burnham and they literally ate Saru, <laughs> the Mirror Universe Saru in that scene. So that kind of threw me because I kept thinking about like, oh, last time we saw a dinner scene with Giorgio, she ate Saru. Um, I thought that they were going to make a joke about that, but I couldn't stop myself from thinking about it throughout that scene. But then we get the other half of this coin of trauma. Um, and I really loved that this episode dealt with this, that the characters all lash out at each other. Detmer's clearly going through something um, and tries to make a haiku and just keeps calling out Stemitz's blood and she just can't process it and can't realize that something's going on. And she sort of starts talking about how she held responsibility for saving the ship, saving the crew. And you, again, get this subtle understanding that show doesn't call it out that she feels guilt for 
people having died in that scene. And Stamets feels the same. He feels guilt as well for not being adequate enough. They both are feeling much the same thing. You know that Stamets and Detmer are feeling inadequate, like they failed, even though they actually succeeded and there was nothing they could have done. It feels, you know, as they said a few episodes ago, feeling helpless is shitty, but we can get beyond it and it's not forever. But you understand that both these characters are kind of going through the same thing, but it also puts them at odds and their trauma just makes them unable to connect with each other. And it just devolves until he kind of calling them out on that and everyone just sort of leaving. It was such a brilliant understanding of like people just can't connect at this moment because they're dealing with so much. There's also a really brilliant scene where when, um, you know, uh, Detmer gets up to leave and Stemix gets up to leave, uh, Wilson Cruz just gives uh, Saru a look. Brilliantly small, subtle acting moment. I, I just like this. Wilson Cruz just sort of like nods to Saru. It's like, yeah, yeah, you see what, what, why we need this. And so, again, this is going to take, this is another one of those scenes that will take me a lot more time to really think through and process, but brilliantly acted and brilliant understanding of of trauma relations the other thing too i should mention with the dinner scene that i almost forgot is it rang very star trek enterprise to me it reminded me of archer's dinners that archer would always have on the nx01 enterprise uh just warmed my heart that there's some subtle ties to enterprise i know probably not intentional but i just liked the fact that the dinner scene just reminded me of Archer being a captain and having his captain's dinners. I'm going to sort of finish out this storyline uh, and come back to the Trill storyline in just a minute. So let's just finish out the Saru and the the, the crew storyline. But uh, then we get another great scene with Tilly coming in and talking to Saru. And I like that Tilly sort of calls out to Saru as like reminding us that we're all connected, even though we're dealing with this, is being a leader. And Saru, I know, feels failure in not being able to get everyone that the dinner went badly. But Tilly reminds him that they're not okay, and that's okay. That just to be reminded that no matter what, they're in this together, just having that reminder, even amongst all the crap that they're dealing with, that's important, even if it doesn't go all the way, and even if it doesn't heal everything all the way right there. Um, and then Stemmets comes in and shows what the importance of that dinner was that it did remind them that they do need to connect with each other, that they do need to reach out even uh, in their pain and they can't lash out at each other right now. And so Saru was not going to fix all this with a dinner, but it was an important reminder to begin those steps. And that's reiterated at the end of the episode where we get the wonderful scene where the crew gets to have a movie night. Again, a wonderful call out to Star Trek Enterprise. In my book, the only other show that I really remember having movie nights on the regular was Star Trek Enterprise. So I'm just saying, Star Trek Enterprise got a lot of things right and definitely knew how to be a good show. Just have to reference Star Trek Enterprise here, but movie nights made me happy. Another Enterprise sort of pseudo reference here. But... I like the scene between Culver and Saru here, where, again, sort of getting to the point that I mentioned earlier, that he's basically saying, we're not okay, but is it is okay to not be okay, as long as we take the time to connect with each other and remind each other that they're in this together. And that was a message that I needed really badly. That was one of the scenes that I just started tearing up at um, in this episode, because Again, the way the world is right now, um, I needed a reminder that we need, uh, that we're not okay right now, but we're in this together. Uh, again, I don't think the writers intended that to come at this specific point in the world's history right now, but I sure as hell needed that message that we're not okay, but we're in it together and we will get through this together. Um, it was just a message I really, really needed at this moment. And that was just one of the scenes that I just bawled at. And I love that Stemets and Detmer hug each other in this moment. I really like that we're starting to see, as I was talking about before with the Tilly and Saru scene, that they are now able to emotionally process their trauma because they are understanding that they are in this together. Detmer earlier with her haiku could not get through the haiku because she just could not process this stuff on her own. But now that she knows that she's in this together, she's able to reach out and connect with Stemets and move past that spot that she was stuck in in processing her trauma. Such a brilliant and subtle discussion of trauma here. I keep saying trauma. How many times can I say trauma? That whole storyline I thought was great. And again, we get the call out of a Saru saying, like, I didn't put this together. I think the computer is starting to gain sentience because of the sphere data and it wants to protect the crew. Again, tying into Calypso. I am still a bit concerned that he's not as concerned as he should be about that because you don't want your ship to sort of go rogue. <laughs> Uh, when it's the only thing you got at the moment. But um, I do like that it's sort of tying into Calypso there. Um, so 
I, I, I am curious to see how that storyline gets paid off, but I like that it's sort of an afterthought here um, and really just focusing on the, the smaller scale story here um, and the human story. Great job. This brings us to the Trill story where I'll kind of skip some of the larger beats, but they bring uh, Adira to the cave. Adira goes into the Trill pools. I thought it was really beautiful. And then we sort of get like the Trill coming down and being like, oh, I don't want you to do this, but Adira's in trouble, so you need to go in. It was it was kind of all perfunctory. I didn't hate any of it, but again, it was sort of like surface level Trill politics that I wish we had kind of gotten a little bit more of, but I understand why they didn't have the time because they were kind of trying to go to this Adira story and tell this more core emotional story um, that I really, really, really want to discuss here. So Adira goes sucked in the pool and Burnham gets goes in after her to try to uh, help her deal with whatever's going on. And we go to this crazy, weird dream realm where all these tendrils are connecting to Adira. And we start to get this, again, this discussion of trauma and how trauma connects to memories and identity. And we get this idea that Adira does not want to deal with her memories because there's something that traumatic that happened and doesn't necessarily want to connect with it. Again, dealing with this idea of to try and bypass trauma, people try to forget it, to hold on to, to ignore their trauma in order to hold on to their own identity. Um, uh, and so great understanding of that, but Burnham pushes Adira to address it. And I love that connection between the two of them. Burnham just constantly saying like, you need to deal with this. Um, you can't run from it. And I like Adira calling her out. It's like, you just want to use me. You're using me for utility. You just want to get that information from Tall. You don't care about me. And Burnham's saying, no, I do care about you, but this is also, yes, I do want that stuff, but it's also about you. Um, so I like the sort of push and pull between the two of them and th their connection in their trauma. And Burnham connecting a little bit there. There was a wonderful line where Burnham sort of, I think, has a realization about herself, about how she needs to deal with her own trauma as well. Um, and sort of like coming to that realization, but also having the mental fortitude to be able to pass that knowledge and that learning off to Adira and push Adira to get to what she needs to face. And then we get the scenes that I have some of the most complex feelings about, because there are things that I well, let's just dive into because I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it in, in, I think, some of the best ways possible. We learn that when Tall, the Admiral Tall, died, um, Adira's boyfriend, played by the wonderful Ian Alexander, who is the other uh, LGBTQ representation being added this season, Ian Alexander, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, trans man and has appeared in many other shows, is a wonderful actor, and I think wonderfully portrayed here by Ian Alexander, does a great job throughout this episode portraying this, uh, portraying this uh, younger Tall, Adira's boyfriend, I forget uh, his name, um, off the top of my head within the episode, but I'll just say younger tall. So I just like that they didn't call it like, hey, transgender character here, how to process this. So we basically learn that uh, Adira was worried about losing her boyfriend when her boyfriend basically had to take the Trill symbiote. I'm assuming because, they don't call this out, but I'm assuming because there's not many other Trill. So even though Ian is fairly young, um, they take the trill on because there's no one else to, um, but also, you know, wants to, it wants to, is able to trust, um, and have Tall join with him. Um, but I also like that Adira has concerns with this joining, um, and saying like, will you still be you after this? This reminds me heavily of how partners feel when their partner comes out as transgender. When they learn that their partner is trans, many partners will choose to stay stay with their partner, but they're also worried that as they go through this transition to another gender or being perceived as another gender, I should say, that their partner won't be them anymore, that they will change so much that they won't be the same. And that is quite often not the case. Just because someone's gender identity may be reflective differently on the outside, that doesn't necessarily mean that who they are inside will change at all. And I like that this episode is sort of grappling with that in just the few key scenes. And there's a wonderful moment where Ian Allen Alexander's character says, this isn't a race. We're figuring this out together. And so I like this sort of metaphor being used about the trans community, but it not being expressly about the trans community. And this gets into one of my first concerns that I have very complex feelings about. I am somewhat disappointed that the transgender characters in the show are still being 
used to tell transgender stories through alien metaphor with the trill who have historically been used throughout Trek to, um, whether intentionally or not, um, been used to tell many transgender themes or many trans people have read trans themes into the trill, again, intentional or not by the writers on like Deep Space Nine or The Next Generation, but it definitely was there. It's why I love Dax so much on Deep Space Nine. So while I do love Dax and I do love the trill symbiotes as a transgender metaphor, I am a bit frustrated that these two LGBTQ non-binary transgender characters are being tied again to the trill and kind of forced to kind of deal with transgender issues through alien metaphor again, um, instead of just having it be explicit. But I also like that they're not saying in this show that because that they are trans or non-binary because they are trill. Um, I know that that might still be possible in Blue Del Barrio's Adira's uh, character's case. She may end up being non-binary because of her trill experience, which I hope they don't do, and I will call that out if that happens. But so far in the show, them being transgender and non-binary characters is not because they are trill. So I like that there is separation between those two things. And I also like the recognition of the importance of the trill to transgender uh, fans of Star Trek by having these characters be tied to it. But I'm also somewhat frustrated as well that they're being used to tell transgender metaphors, but not explicitly so. So there's so many complex feelings here. Again, you can kind of see where I don't have one set thought process on it, where I'm saying it's good, it's bad, I hate it, I love it. It's complex. And I honestly, I will say... I don't think they get anything explicitly wrong here. And the fact that they are able to walk this really tight line of being complex, of using metaphors, but not getting the metaphors wrong. Like, I don't think the metaphors are incorrectly used or they, like, make unfortunate messages, at least so far. There it might be some, but the writers are weaving this together very complexly and very intriguingly that does not overtly bother me, but it concerns me, but in a way that I'm not hating it you can kind of see why i'm still trying to parse this out i'm going to have to think about this even before i could talk about this for another hour and so i'm going to have to move on but i will say this i don't hate it i kind of love it <laughs> but i'm also trying to analyze my love of it so there's many layers going on there um as a trans person i just have many thoughts here then uh, just moving on though I think there's this, this wonderful human, uh, human being probably the incorrect word, but this beautiful scene between the two of them where Adira gives uh, Ian Alexander's character, I'm tall, a gift. And I just love the like interplay. It's like, we have a love thing. They just, they, they connect. They have such great chemistry, the two of them. And I was just absolutely loving it. Encouraging them. It's like, you are a good artist. Like, oh, you're dealing with anxiety, but you're being a brilliant artist. And how much they encourage each other. Beautifully written uh, relationship in just the few scenes that they have together. And I love that Adira's gift to Tall is a quilt. How perfect is that as a symbol for memory, for the trill, for trauma, for stories and all the ideas that Blue Del Barrio is getting to? There's so much just packed in that usage of the quilt. What a brilliant choice. I, 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 I adore the quilt as a metaphor for, for all of the stuff going on here. Again, the writers just being layering so many complex ideas and thoughts here. I just can't parse it out and it's beautiful and thoughtful and complex and deep. I just keep using that word because it is and it's so hard for me to parse it out so quickly after the episode. I loved it. I just loved it. Um, and then we get the scene that I have probably the most complex feelings about in that an asteroid hits the ship and kills Ian Alexander's character. And then Blue Del Barrio has to take on the, the symbiote. Again, this kind of gets into a concern that I have where this is a barrier gay storyline where we get a, a queer character, a queer romance, and one of them dies in order to, you know, advance the story. We saw this in season one of Discovery with Hugh Culper being killed, but I feel like un unlike the way that it was sort of cheaply used by killing off Culber in a very cheap way, this trauma is tying into the themes of the story, the emotions of the story, the emotion of the character and dealing with trauma and backstory. So again, it's complicated. <laughs> I don't love the use of the barrier gay storyline here, but I also think it is in service of really beautiful storytelling and beautiful character development. And as we see at the end of the episode, Ian Alexander's character, Tall, will still show up. So not completely gone? 
from the show, which is fascinating. So it's not completely a barrier gay storyline in terms of the character's presence and, and importance to the show and to uh, Adira, but also playing off this idea of because Adira is able to address her memories and come to terms with that trauma, at least start processing it, she can still have a relationship with her memories and with this memory of this person that she loved. And you can't cordon off these memories because you lose things that are important to you. And that enables Adira to have a relationship with this person that she lost, even though, and, and is able to like, and symbolized by that cello in this moving forward. It's... Again, I'm going to need more time to process it. I've ranted about this enough. It's complex. It's layered. It's deep. It is problematic, but problematic in a way that I find intriguing and not just like, I'm going to social justice warrior rant about it. It's a very complex um, version of these stories and these tropes, and I really appreciate it. it. It's weaving a very tight line, but I'm interested and I'm intrigued. I got to move on from it. We sort of get the wrap out. I get this. We get this wonderful scene where Adira gets pulled out of the uh, the the pool. We get these. We get to see the past trill symbiotes of Tall. I like that it's uh, not Dax. I thought the revelation was going to be, oh, it's Dax. And we're going to see the previous Dax host um, somehow. Um, but I like that it's not so explicitly being like, yeah, let's have that reference in here. I like seeing this sort of past host. I like um, Burnham saying thank you to uh, the elder Tall, um, the Admiral Tall character here and saying you gave me hope and inspired me and him saying thank you i i greatly enjoyed that scene um we got sort of the reference that they trill when they're pulled out saying hey we want to rejoin the federation if you're able to pull the federation together trill will rejoin the federation again i wish we had gotten a little bit more of the development of the trill characters one other thing that i did forget to mention i did find the asteroid sort of hitting the ship a bit cheap to sort of get to that barrier gaze moment i like the emotion and character development that it's all dealt into but the asteroid sort of hitting the ship just felt like uh the writer's being like i don't know uh we need to kill this character so uh an asteroid hits the ship and like wouldn't they have shields or something that felt a bit convenient i do need to call that out and i meant to um so yeah the asteroid hitting the ship felt a bit cheap um but again it's in service of other larger stuff so i'm i i don't love it but i'm willing to forgive it but that is a kind of cheap narrative trick there that it's just like ah asteroid hits the ship whatever um yeah and I think that's everything that I have to say. Uh, there's a scene sort of wrapping out with with Adira and Burnham, um, but I kind of talked a little bit about that already, but I like their connection through trauma um, in that moment. So yeah, uh, I cried <laughs> throughout a lot of that stuff with Ian and Adira. I cried at the end of the episode with the movie night scene. This episode, like I said, hit me hard. And I am still processing it, as you can clearly see throughout this very messy review. Um, but like I said several times, it is complex in a way that I find very interesting and am loving. And even beyond my potential concerns um, with this episode, it still hit me so hard right in in the heart. Um in a way that few episodes of Star Trek have ever done before. And again, that might just be the moment that we're at in history, but when has Star Trek not spoken to where we are in history, whether it was intentional or not? Um, and this episode just... I don't know. It was beautiful. Beautiful in its complexity and in its failures and its successes. And that's what I love about Star Trek is that it's never perfect, and yet it still is beautiful. Oh, guys, this episode, I gotta stop. I'm gonna wrap up this review right now. I love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Um, what did you think of this episode? Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Um, I, like I said, I am going to have many more thoughts about this episode. I may even do a whole other video at some point in the next week or so, but don't hold me to that because life is busy. Um, but many thoughts. I love this episode, even though I had problems with it. Uh, but the problems were things that I loved. I'm confused. I hope you're confused too. Have a wonderful night and live long and prosper, everybody. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Chamomile T, Philip Sorbello, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Stefan Schuhart, Wellington Marcus, Wayne Twitchell, Buttoneer, 
Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Nathan Olson, Amanda Ronnie Indange, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F., Miguel Posadas, Jason Knott, Maeve, Andrew Jorgenston, Sabraxis, Jasmine, Chris Brown, Bree Beecher, Nathan Steele, Chloe Dollar, Jane Packard, Dante St. James, Wendizzle Bizzle, Geek Filter, Mark the Edge, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Gretchen Badger, Sarah Bystam, Celestial Dawn, Polly Mina, Din, Jean Mithoon, Lysa, Andrew Lamoro, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy. Thank you, all of you, especially this month.